Okay. Second. Hello everyone and welcome to this fireside chat as part of the BNEX cohort certification on diversity and inclusion, overcoming unconscious bias. I'm thrilled to be joined here today by Sandra Thiedemann. Sandra is one of the leading experts on workplace diversity, cross-cultural business and bias reduction. As president of Cross-Cultural Communications, a San Diego-based training firm, Sandra has over 25 years experience as a speaker, trainer and author, helping professionals in Fortune 500 companies, public sector organizations and dozens of associations find ways to successfully navigate our increasingly diverse workplaces. She is also the author of four books, including Three Keys and most recently, Making Diversity Work, Seven Steps for Defeating Bias in the Workplace. Hello, Sandra. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Oh, you've been my lovely to be here. Thank you. Great. So I'll just start with my first question uh, for you here, which is um, how do we discover our unconscious biases and how do we overcome them? The good news is there's a lot we can do to discover them and overcome them. One thing that's um, got me into this field of specialty is that so many people kept saying there was nothing we could do about them, that all we could do was work around them. And as I did research and looked at other people's work, I discovered a couple of really interesting things. First of all, how can we become aware of them? It's a matter of paying attention. And it's a matter of paying attention to two things. One, what's the first thought we have when we encounter someone different from ourselves? Whether it be we see someone from another country or someone from another uh, of another race or someone in a wheelchair or someone of a different sexual orientation, whatever it is. Is there a thought, an assumption that comes into our brain about what they're like? That just might be a bias. So that's one way to do it. Another way to become aware of them is to watch your actions and your decisions. Uh, I'm thinking for hiring professionals in particular, do you tend to hire people from the same part of the country uh, who speak the same dialect? who dress the same way. Um, if you do, stop and think about it. Watch yourself. Could it be that you've got an inflexible belief, which is what a bias is, about that group, and you're just laying it on top of every single applicant um, and therefore figuring they're all good at a particular thing? So um, another way to do it again, watch your decision making, watch your thought, watch your decision making. And then as far as how do we overcome them, there's a lot that we can do. I could go on forever about this, but uh, that awareness is the first piece. Um, a couple of other things is to um, analyze it. Analyze that first thought or those decisions you're making as a pattern to see uh, whether they make any sense. Um, how many people do you really know who conform to that quality that you're, that's popping into your brain? Uh, how many people do you know who don't conform? Right there, you're learning something. If you learn, well, wait a minute, hang on, I do know a lot of people that don't. And, um, and come to think of it, I have only know one or two people that do conform. Um, it starts to, to weaken it. How did you learn it is another thing that you're going to ask yourself. Did I learn it from a reliable source or did I learn it from a, a racist teacher or parents that, that had particularly biased attitudes toward a particular population? If you did, it begins to weaken. So that awareness piece and then analyzing. And let me just touch on one more issue. There's others I can do, but I... It's something I'm gonna talk about uh, during the presentation and it, it really means a lot to me. And that is what we've learned about identifying what we have in common as a tool toward reducing our biases. And the way it works is we're not denying difference. We're not asking anyone to change, but by identifying something we value the same, we're forming a third group. So you have someone in your workplace that you have a bias about their group, and then you begin to socialize with them more. And maybe your leadership begins to create opportunities for people to mix. And in the course of that, you begin to see, oh, golly, 
we have the same attitude toward family. We have the same passion for soccer. We care, a we both have an absolute minute, wonderful knowledge of fine wines. And you begin to form a third group that you share together while you're different. And studies have shown that for a variety of reasons that within that sharedness, we begin to see people as individuals, not just as members of another group, and therefore the bias begins to fade. So I hope that helps. There's more we yeah. can do, but those practical things, I think that's what's important to remember. This isn't psychotherapy, you know, it isn't uh, necessarily confrontational. It's just watching your thinking, watching your actions, changing those actions, exposing yourself more to people to find out what you have in common and um, biases will gradually erode. Yeah, I think that's such a wonderful point. And these oversimplification biases we have really are almost helpless in the face of um, finding common ground and getting to know people as individuals, I think. And the, the, the fact that those will gradually start to erode, the more we can find of the values we have in common with people. And um, it's such a wonderful point. And it's great that there is so much hope that these biases can yes. be undone. Um, yes. There is the work there that can be done. And it's, it's not impossible. So. Not impossible. And, and I'm not talking about the deeply rooted biases that are supported strongly by a culture, like a racist culture where the whole, it's always coming at you and it's reinforced all the time by your family and it's deep rooted back into your history. Those are tougher. I don't mean to say be completely cavalier, but, but most of us can get at them using these techniques. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so that leads me to my next question, which is about um, how can we help our managers foster a culture of trust and safety and equal voices? I think first of all, I think the managers and leaders should be exposed to these concepts around around bias. But um, three words really come, come to mind, transparency. There is a um, CEO of an extremely large uh, US-based company that several years ago became aware of his own biases. It was a racial issue, his own biases. And he stood in front of uh, a dinner meeting of, look to me from the tape, I wasn't there, but hundreds of people and confessed it and talked about how he became aware of it and talked about how he wanted to help others in the organization overcome theirs. That right there, right there, that 12 minutes, whatever it was, set off conversations within the organization that gradually have changed things because it gave them a way to talk about it. And it modeled transparency and it modeled, don't be afraid, to be honest, don't be afraid to look at yourself. So that transparency is, is everything. And also talk about it as leaders. Bring it up. If you have manager meetings, you know, every month, every Monday morning, whatever it is, have bias and diversity and inclusion stuff. Be part of those meetings. Have a little activity that you do. Or how's it going with those things you learned about bias? You know, um, let's all read this, you know, a book together and do a little book report. Those kinds of things keeps it top of mind. So I think that would really help your leadership. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Transparency and talking about it and not ignoring it and really making that conscious effort. I think. Thank you for that. Wonderful. Um, so moving now to talk a little bit about the the watch, think, act model that you talk about um, as a way to overcome unconscious biases. Could you tell us a little more about these three steps and how you use them and how you'd recommend others? Well, the the, the watch, think, act is really a convenient way to boil down the steps. And the watch is the self-awareness. Watch the first thought that comes to mind, watch and keep track of the decisions you are making with respect to hiring, with respect to how you treat people, with respect to who you hang out with. Watch to see, is there some, are you making choices that just might be reflecting a bias? So that's the, first step in that. Think. Think is back to the issues of analysis. Think about that first thought. 
is it, does it make sense? How'd you learn it? Did you learn it from somebody who's erudite and sophisticated and has broad experience and is very self-aware? Did you learn it from somebody who was frightened of a particular population or had a bad experience? Something like that. I think about, um, I'm thinking about my parents. My parents were uh, good people, really good people. We, they grew up in rural New Jersey um, here in the States and moved out to Hollywood um, in, uh, in the 1940s. And, and they were what I called ambivalent racists because they were exposed to less, less than admirable attitudes toward African-Americans in their culture growing up, not extreme, but just it, the, the ones that are a little more difficult to get at because they're subtle and, and they're good people and they feel a little bad about it, but they still feel it. And so I would get these subtle messages uh, about, uh, let me give you an example. When a, we, I lived in a neighborhood that was um, uh, largely Anglo-Saxon. And if an African-American family moved into the neighborhood, uh, my mother would be so lovely at greeting them and taking them something, cookies to welcome them and all those kinds of things. But this gets a little nuanced here. She didn't do it when other people moved into the neighborhood. Now, what message did that send me? There's something different about those people. There's something maybe almost fragile about those people that need special treatment. When she meant to do it, but she was I was getting this message that she was doing it out of their differentness, not just welcome me to the neighborhood like she would everyone else. Just that nuance, that nuance. So that's a way that I um, got a got a bias, I think, a subtle, subtle bias, which I managed to make go away pretty much in my 20s when I got out from that influence. But what was so interesting, and I recently wrote an article about this, when my father was dying of cancer um, uh, when he was 74 years old and he was in the hospital and I was visiting him and he'd made friends with an African-American man who was also in the hospital. And he said to me, he made it his business to say to me, I realize now I was wrong. We're all just people. We've got to take them one person at a time. And so that was the person inside that was there all along, even though he'd make the occasional comment. So finding out where we learn these things um, is really a good way to begin to erode them because we may find that the source wasn't that awfully reliable. And, and again, exposing ourselves to people who are like, who, with whom we have something in common, trying to find out what do we share is a very important tool toward eroding our biases. And it's an action. It's going out and meeting people and bringing up subject matters that you normally wouldn't bring up. Are, and do we find something we have in common? Once we do that, we begin to see them as individuals. There's a lot we can do. Thank you so much for sharing those um, very personal stories. And um, yeah, I think uh, the idea of going back to the source of where these biases come from is, is really interesting and thinking about the reliability of that and the nuances uh, behind um, where those biases come from is, is really fascinating and something that a lot of people I think maybe will struggle uh, to do and to um, to unpick for themselves and confront for themselves. So but it's, it's such an important thing to do. Um, and that leads me to uh, my next question here for you is, uh, how do biases actually impact our effectiveness as both individuals and as leaders? It all boils down to the fact that we can't see people for who they are. It all boils down to that. We can't hire the right people because we're assuming they're a particular way. We can't motivate them because we assume they're gonna want a particular thing because of the group that they belong to. And motivation is everything. We can't create a culture in which they feel comfortable. So we're apt to get people leaving 
if they aren't comfortable within the culture, if they don't feel that their ideas and the way they are and what they have to bring is being valued and biases interfere with that. So we can't motivate them. We can't meet their needs. And again, to get back to that basic one, we, we as leaders, we're not apt to be hiring, hiring the right people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, Related to that, um, how how can we discover these biases across our processes and our policies and our practices? What should we be looking out for? That's an interesting exercise and um, a very valuable one. And I think it's one that perhaps organizations should go through every three or four years. Um, it's very simple. Get a team together. Get a team together of people of uh, different backgrounds. And also I'm thinking different levels within the organization. I'm working with an organization now that's doing just that. Look at everything. Look at all your policies. Look at all your application forms, all your descriptions of job positions, all of your customer service material, and, and look and evaluate. Is there anything there that in any way is excluding anyone in an inappropriate way. Sometimes you do need to exclude people, but exclude in an inappropriate way or on the reverse side, including someone in a way that isn't productive and that reflects a bias about that particular group. It's a mechanical action. Um, I can't say it's necessarily fun. You know, I, I think that you'll hit things and, and there'll be debates. There'll be debates. No, wait a minute. That that, but, but if we change it that way, that's going to exclude this other group, right? I mean, that can, you can get a little crazy, but wow, how powerful it is. And and think about too, that action goes back to the issue of what can leadership do and how can leadership create a good environment. That action, the fact the leader did it, did it and said we're taking the time. It's worth the money. It's worth the time. It's worth your time to do it sends a message to the organization of how important diversity and inclusion is. So it's got a whole double function going on. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And what you shared about that CEO being so kind of radically transparent about their oh. own biases says um, so much, doesn't it? And really, like yeah. you say, sends such a strong message um, just to set the tone throughout the organization. Um, and this really leads me on to my next question, which is about as we're going through this very deep rooted transformational journey, what do we stand to to gain and what um, what are the business outcomes that we can expect um, as we embark on this transformational? There are so many of them. Retention is huge. Um, retention and people staying because they feel that they can be the best that they can be, that they can bring it. This is a practical thing. I mean, you can break this down to dollars and cents. And, it, you know, people who in my work, I find clients that are receptive to the material because it's the right thing to do. And then I find others that aren't that, that no, no, I have to keep thinking about business. I have to think about only business. And that right thing issue is of less importance. And I say, well, heck, I can give you a heck of a business case. And, and one of the biggest ones is what's your turnover rate, you know, are, and, 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 and are you also attracting the best people? Because people today, now I'll be candid with you, I'm not certain how this is working in other parts of the world, but in North America, people who are applying for jobs are going, are, are looking at other people, do other people who look like me work there? Do are those, or, or do they have a high turnover rate in that population? Who, who, what's the face of the organization? So the hiring and the retention piece. Um, uh, I have to talk about innovation and I, I might've mentioned it before. It Innovation is everything. And it is, I don't care how small an organization you've got, I don't care how large one, it is, you need it. And it is a business piece. When you have a workforce that it consists of people who think differently. You have a more innovative workforce. Now, they might be of a different uh, gender, might be sexual orientation, might be part of the country that they're from, might be a different culture, they might speak a different language, they might have gone to a different university. I'm not talking about one type of difference. It can be age, it can be anything. Those kinds of differences bring different ways of thinking, which therefore, are giving you new ideas. But here's the other piece of it that we don't often think about. When people are thinking differently in a problem-solving group, 
And if we were doing like a chat here or something, I'd say, take a minute and talk about it. What does that look like? And what that often looks like is people aren't understanding each other. You know, you come up with some idea and I'm going, I, I don't get it. And do I admit that? I might not admit it, but I'm going to think harder. Like, what, what did she mean by, I'm, I don't get what she's talking about. Do you get what she's talking about? I don't get it. And so I have to dig deeper to understand and I have to ask you questions that's going to make you, whom I'm not understanding, explain it clearer, therefore think it clearer. Also, you're apt to come after me and say, your idea doesn't make any sense, Sandra. I don't, I, I don't like it. I've got a whole different point of view. I now have to think deeper and harder to defend myself. Doesn't that all just sound like fun? It really does, because all of a sudden, you've got people really churning this thing. And that's where innovation comes from. And let me just touch on one more piece with the business case customers. Uh, your customer situation for every single person that's watching, this is going to be different. But within the, I'm going to have to talk about US here, uh, several studies have shown that a reasonable percentage, measurable important percentage of the population cares whether or not an organization is uh, cares about human rights and it shows that they care about it. Customers to a reasonable percent will care to come to, will choose one company over another company if they have a reputation of caring about human rights. And that would be the whole IND piece. Also, and is when you have a diverse population, I'm thinking of PepsiCo here in the US. Um, PepsiCo had a, what we call a, a, um, a employee resource group that consisted of uh, Latinos and Hispanics, people of, of, of Mexican and primarily, I believe it was Mexican and Central American backgrounds. And that employee resource group was tasked with researching what products would really sell within the immigrant communities here that are from Latin countries. And they came up with some products and it ended up making billions of dollars for PepsiCo. Now, could they have gotten them another way and figured out another way? Yeah, but would it have been as rapid and would it have been as, as precisely correct? And would the marketing have been right on for the various groups? Maybe not. So just that alone, it's good for business. You can't fault, it cannot be. And it's got nothing to do with discrimination suits and the rest. It has to do with these positive things. Thank you so much. Yeah, what a comprehensive um, outline of just the, the business impacts and um, from a talent acquisition standpoint, hiring and just every every level, it stands to have enormous benefit um, across every aspect of running an organization. So thank you for, for giving such a comprehensive answer there. Um, and this is actually my last question for you uh, today, Sandra, and thank you for giving such a, a wonderful uh, um, answers today, such an enjoyable conversation. No, um, so my last question is, what is your advice um, for HR leaders embarking on this journey of transformation? I have a simple answer. I saw that question was coming and I've written down here, answer colon, examine themselves first. Start with who you are. That's the very first thing you need to do is argue fairly clean on, you're never gonna get perfect. But do you have you explored your own unconscious biases and conscious ones? And also, let me add, familiarize yourself with this process. Make sure you understand it. Um, and other areas of inclusion and diversity, I think um, difficult conversations comes to mind. That, that's another area of, of the issue that an HR person, I know, HR people have so many difficult conversations, but uh, examining it, doing research, reading articles about how you handle them when they involve the hurt feelings and the pain and the things that go along with an awkward or inappropriate conversation around inclusion and diversity. But I'll, I'll come back to end and I'll go back to the beginning of that answer and say, examine yourselves first. I think that's what we all need to do. It's a constant process. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it is a constant process starting with yourself and, and looking inwards, I think, before you yeah. can have the energy to, to make outward action. So um, thank you so much um, for those wonderful answers and for such a great conversation. We are so excited to have you joining us, Sandra, for the BNEX cohort certification on um, overcoming unconscious bias and which will be running from the 10th of May to the 4th of June. And um, for more information, you can follow the link uh, that will follow uh, this broadcast. Um, but that's all from us here today. And uh, just saying thank you again to Sandra for joining us today, for sharing your thoughts. Yeah. And um, yes, yeah, so we look forward to, to the class and the program with you as well. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Come on.